so we can start in one minute uh, uh, i'm starting the recording so that people uh, who see it later they can join start it and i am making with the presenter bob Yes, uh, I can see your screen, Bob. I can't hear you, Bob. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, ready to start? Yes. Okay. Okay, hi. My name is Bob Resselman. Thank you for having me here this evening for you, this morning for me from sunny Southern California, Los Angeles. Sony Pictures is right down the street, so if I ever get washed up in technology, I can go over and make be an extra in the movies. You know, a five-minute walk from here. So I have a path forward in my career. Anyway. Um, again, welcome to this talk, uh, What Do We Do When Everything is Automated? Um, I am Bob Resselman. I am a active uh, technical uh, I'm a developer. I also do uh, analysis and technical journalism and documentation for a number of periodicals. Uh, DevOps.com, Tech Target, Red Hat, IBM, all of the above. I've been writing for uh, many, many years, and I've been developing for many, many years. Uh, around uh, 2016, actually not around, right after 2016, in November uh, 2016, I became very uh, interested in the impact of uh, automation on um, uh, the human experience uh, for a variety of reasons, which I'll go into if you want me to later. Uh, so much so that I started writing a series of essays on um, DevOps.com, about 1230 of them, that has been published into a book called The Impact of Automation, the essays on the effects of artificial intelligence and thinking machines on human experience. Uh, you can download it uh, from, uh, I think the uh, download is in the invitation for this event. If not, at the end of the talk, I'll put a link where you can get the book. It's free. It's free. It was already, it's been sponsored by DevOps.com, Accelerated Technology, so you can have it. Um, I'm going to talk, I can go into a lot of my background about why I'm qualified or unqualified to talk about the topic, and I will later if you want me to, but right now I'm going to be working off of this assertion, and the assertion is this, that automation is improving at near exponential rates. In the past, it's been focused on manual tasks, such as those found in manufacturing and transportation. However, as advances in computing make the thinking machine possible, human labor engaged in cognitive as well as physical tasks will be replaced increasing rates by automation. The question is not if, it's when. And then when all happens, what do we do? And so I'm going to be talking about uh, four things. I'm going to um, talk about the impact of automation. I'm going to look at the landscape. But for those of you that are unaware of how broad automation is in our, glo our global activities and what we do every day, I'm going to show you some things that surprised me as I started doing my research. I said, wow, I didn't know this was here. Uh, and then I'm going to take a look at the impact of automation. And then I'm going to examine some ways to move forward. Uh, so the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with showing you how to make a robotic brain surgeon. Um, this is uh, the Da Vinci XI system. And what the Da Vinci machine is, actually my hospital has one, but the Da Vinci machine is a surgeon enhancement tool. And if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see that the surgeon uh, puts his um, head and hands into this device, which is on the right, brought over to the surgical area. And with robotic assistance, you can do surgery. And this is happening a lot. Da Vinci's a well-known system. It's in a lot of hospitals. The interesting thing about um, Da Vinci is that it's wired to a system. It's wired to all the other Da Vinci's. And for those of you that are, are, are aware, 
aware of machine learning, you probably know the more data that the machine learning algorithms can consume, the smarter it becomes. Uh, that became pretty apparent if you look at the video for the AlphaGo competition between a, a supercomputer and the world's leading Go um, master. The computer won four out of five times. And the reason the computer won four out of five times is they took every, uh, hundreds of thousands of Go games and fed it in to the uh, system, into the AI system. And as more games came in, it began to learn a variety of ways of how to do Go until eventually it created its own way of playing Go that completely baffled the Go master. And the relevance here to surgery is that as more surgeons start using more da Vinci machines, all of the data that this mach these machines are generating, and by data I mean what the surgeon is looking at, the video, because uh, the surgeon is looking at the video camera that's looking at the surgery area, the manual movement of the surgeon, the um, mistakes they make, the recovery, all that stuff. If you do it for a long enough period of time, eventually the machine will be able to figure it out and the machine will be able to do it on its own. And then the question becomes, what is the scope of surgery that a machine can do? So, for example, do we want a, a, a robot doing brain surgery? Oh, I don't know. But do we want robots doing simple app appendectomies, which is a very, it's, it's, you know, all surgery is dangerous. There's no question about it. But on a scale of one to 10, an appendectomy has been, been done for 300 years. And could we trust a robot to do it? Probably. Probably. So we could eventually, the as a more... Uh, surgeries happen, more brain surgeries happen, will we be able to create robotic brain surgeries? Well, the question and the answer is, it's already been done at MIT. Okay, so now robot-assisted surgery, surgery is a thing. So uh, there you go, there's a job. Oh, I'll, I'll now you know, your brain surgeon says, I'll never be replaced by automation. Well, you will, you will. So let's move, move on. That's just the, uh, the, the entry to what we're about to do. So let, let me tell you right now that I, I really do like technology. Um, this is a, a picture of a, uh, of, a, of a textile mill. I think it's from New England around uh, the uh, late 19th, early 20th, early, late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, the kids looked a little different, but children worked in mills. Going to school, universal um, education wasn't something that was in the U.S., until really recently in history, the last 60 years. And I, I need to just comment that I don't have a lot of insight into international cultures of how they they, they deal with stuff. I'm pretty intimate with uh, the United States economy. And I, I, I've lived all, I've lived, traveled all over the world. And I've lived all over the world, but the level of detail that I can discuss is pretty confined to U.S. So later on, if you have questions or comments about things going on in other parts of the world, particularly India, where I think I'm broadcasting right now, feel free. But anyway, this was, you know, if we look at this, go back to the picture here, this mill, this textile mill, this was this kid's life, right? This this kid, what they would do is they change the swools, fix the machines, and eventually they grow up to be able to work the machines, maybe become a mechanic, and that was their life. So it really isn't something that, you know, I'd want my children doing, and they don't. My children don't. Why? Because now we can make, um, we can use a robot to make, to run a textile mill. And this is the Toyota, you know, the, the, the Jibo Toyota um, um, milling machine, the loom. It's an automated loom. I think if we run it, you can see that. Notice where it does. It's just they're out there making materials independently with nobody's help. Pretty interesting, I'd say. So anyway, sorry about that. So let's talk about the landscape of automation. All right. I do like, oh, I do like tech, but danger, danger. There is a danger at hand. So um, this is um, from Walmart. This is the 1940 census. Every 10 years in the United States, you have to do a census. As a matter of fact, modern computing, um, IBM started, got their big start as uh, the uh, Computational Tabular Corporation. Uh, I think it was uh, CRT, or Computational Recording Tabulation. It's CRT uh, using the Hollerith machines. In the 1890 census was the first time a tabulating machine was used in the United States. And then by uh, 1900, tabulating machines were used all the time. And eventually, CTRs bought by IBM and tabulating machines became the first IBM System 7, uh, I think it's IBM System 701 or 7001, one of those numbers. But anyway, CTR and tabulating machines turned into IBM. However, going back to the picture here, this is a room full of census takers. 
All right. And that's what they did. They would get the forms and fill up rooms and just do data entry all day long. That was their life. And what we've evolved to now is if we look, you can, we've eliminated the data entry personnel. A person can just go fill in their census form and go directly into the machine. No need for humans. Why? Except as data generators. You know, we need less humans as data processors. All right. So that's one thing. I'm removing the, uh, the uh, human uh, data entry labor. That's one. Uh, I find this one interesting. Uh, uh, let's see, this is the um, uh, Mitsui, Mitsui Miner. This is a uh, robotic mining machine. It's a big, big uh, hauler to go uh, to move dust. And what's interesting, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, it's moving down how big that thing is, because there's a little white truck, right? Let me, let me play it again. Oh, sorry. But that little white truck is really, really little, and that big mining machine is really, really big, and it's being run by a robot. And there's some human monitoring, but it's all robotic. All right. Oh, there it is. I'm running it again. Just so you're dining so I can go over and point it out. Just how big this thing is. And there it is. See that that little white truck over there, you know, and that big thing, and that's all driverless. And I'm going to talk about more about driverless technology I'm going to, uh, as we go on. I think it's a big deal, and there's some big impact around that. All right, so this is the Sea Hunter. Uh, this is a uh, unmanned surface vehicle for the United States Navy. Uh, there's not a human being on it, and it just runs around looking for submarines. That's what it does. No humans need apply. Uh, we can just run it without you. And that's one of many military technologies that are either drones or run robotically. Then we have this one. Uh, I like this one. This is the uh, Yara Birkin. It's, I think it's supposed to be released. Uh, um, it was, it is being released this year. It's a Norwegian shipping company, and this is a robotic shipping container. And shipping containers are critical to international trade. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Los Angeles, they, they over the last 10 years, I think, they redid the port of Los Angeles so that it could take, uh, it could accept larger shipping containers. I mean, just monsters, cities on the water that just do nothing but move goods before uh, over goods over the country. That's how come we can have international trade. And this one will be a robot. Uh, freighters by nature don't have a lot of people on them. I think the crews, don't hold me to this, I have to look it up. But I think you know, the crews are under 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 two or three dozen. Now we even got rid of that. This will just run over the water, put the containers in, and away you go. All right, uh, manufacturing. This is interesting. This is what the, in Detroit, which was you know, the big three, all the big three auto manufacturers in the United States work with Detroit. You could get a good paying job uh, with really no, uh, with maybe a primary school education because, <clears throat> excuse me, when the company hired you, you would be taught how to do your job. And because of uh, uh, Frederick Taylor, and, or, and uh, um, assembly line production and um, uh, uh, efficiency experts, um, th those jobs could be taught very quickly so that you could move people through the line. You didn't need a lot of education to do a job that was repetitive, but human beings did repetitive work. They made a very good wage, a very good wage for the whole generation of people that came out of uh, the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, that worked in assembly lines. I could afford to send the kids to college and become white collar professionals. Um, that is what a modern uh, assembly line looks like in Detroit now. Where have all the humans gone? Well, they're still there, but there's not a lot of them. We're just pretty much watching the machines. Oh. It's interesting, but I'm not going to uh, belabor the point. So that's making stuff. Let's talk about moving stuff. Um, this is the Packworth Kenworth T80. Uh, is a level four automation truck, which means the vehicle can operate without human override under ideal environmental conditions. There's a very there in, uh, autonomous driving has now become a regulated industry. So you can um, you have levels one, two, three, and four. I think level four is the uh, most constrained where you can't put people, where you can't put trucks in complex navigational areas. So this truck is robotic. It's made by Kenworth. Uh, Kenworth is a major um, truck manufacturer in the United States. And so even though this truck cannot negotiate, uh, let's say the streets of Los Angeles or the streets of New York, because there are just too many cars, what it can do is you can go into what's called a, a depot system. So you get a transnational highway 
and the uh, transnational highway. It's like one big line, really. If you look at route, uh, route uh, 10 in the United States or 80 or 90, these are the tra- those are the major highways that go right across the continental United States, uninterrupted. Uh, there's not a lot of um, a curve, you know, not a lot of tricky curves. It's a relatively straight line. So what you do is you put an autonomous vehicle on this road, and then you have an easy straight line regional depot where you have smaller trucks or even um, human nav- human driven uh, semi trailers at the depot, and then you have robots really move the cargo from the robotic truck onto the human driven de- uh, vehicle, and then it can be taken in the city streets. So this, people might say this is a little fantastic. This will never happen. Well, no, it is happening. There's a bar trucks.com. Uh, they have a fully autonomous, fully autonomous driven truck. It is now on the roads doing its thing and, um, it's, uh, getting major investment. I don't know when their IPO is coming, but it is coming. So now we have, what are we going to do with all those truck drivers? Uh, well, that becomes an interesting question. We'll talk about that in a minute, but there go the truck drivers. Um, there's still some regulatory laws, but, uh, some regulations, excuse me, but uh, they're, they're diminishing uh, because commerce commerce likes driverless trucks because in the United States, the law is such a driver can only drive for 11 hours and then they have to stop where a driverless semi-truck can go 24-7. And it's more efficient. You can move more freight faster, less, less risk. And the studies are showing that you really want to have driver, driverless vehicles um, become the major means of transportation as soon as possible because once they become on the grid, you know, human fatalities go down. They're just fundamentally safe for uh, vehicles provided they're every, that there's no crazy humans out there driving tr- cars. There's crazy humans out there driving cars. Humans kill humans in cars. Very rare for, uh, 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 very rare for a machine to kill a, dr- a human in a car, if that makes sense. Anyway, all right, let's look at this one. This is uh, the uh, mass transit. This is technical milestones. This is Siemens. Um, what they did. This is the first autonomous tram. So this uh, build it and they will follow. This is in uh, let's see, this is in Potsdam. So this is you know it's a train. It's a city train, a trolley car that just goes to and fro, carries passengers. No conductor required. No driver required. Um, there you go. Talk to mechanics. Feel free to read. I'll give you the link if you want to read it. Oh, this one's fun. Uh, this is the uh, GMD SW1. 1200 mg it's an electric road locomotive oh by the way uh there's no drive no driver so now let's see what do we have we have major um uh, maritime trade being done by robots we have trucks being run by robots and now we have trains being run by robots what's left what's left well let's take a look we we'll talk about of course the load hanging fruit is autonomous cars now what's interesting about autonomous cars particularly to uber and lyft is profitability so right now, and, 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 um, I'm, I'm going to assume that people are familiar with Uber and Lyft. You, you know, you call up, up, up until COVID-19 came along, you called up, a car shows up with a driver in front of your door, you get in, it takes you to destination, you never change hands, you do all your billing through your phone, all that stuff. It's completely automated uh, activity except for the driver driving the vehicle. Well, that driver driving the vehicle costs money. So what you really want to do, one of the things you might want to do is just get rid of the driver. Well, if we start looking at the investment, uh, who's making investments in what? Uh, GM is making a lot of investments in uh, self-driving vehicles. Uber is investing in self-driving vehicles. Apple is investing in self-driving vehicles. Why is Uber investing in self-driving vehicles? Do they really care what uh, other people, you know, do they really care about consumer driving? No. What they want is there's a good argument to be made that if we go to autonomous, if we own our fleet of autonomous vehicles, then we can eliminate the labor of the human, not out of nefarious reasons, it's not that we don't want humans driving the cars, but rather we'd rather have robots driving the cars because they can go 24 seven, they cost less. And when all the robots are driving the cars, it's fundamentally safer. It's fundamentally safer. And you can see here in on San Francisco, you got the cruise, that's an autonomous uh, minivan. Um, again, I'm showing you stuff here. Ubers, they're going to be going driverless, and Apple's going to be driverless. And all the big three are investing in driverless technologies. Gee, that's interesting. Why? All right, so let's talk about So now we've got transportation. That's sort of done. Where else can we t- what else can we do to have uh, automation impact our, our economy? What could we do? Well, let's take a look at entertainment. This is a, a chart of uh, animation. 
animation, and, and sadly, I don't have the number of anime uh, number of animated films compared to live actor films. But if you look at the growth of animation from 1995 to 2016, you'll see that here uh, uh, of the uh, market share, uh, it was only on, under three percent, and then by 2016, market share became 20 percent. That's significant growth over uh, over 20 years to really have uh, cartoons really have cartoons um, take over uh, uh, a, a majority of, 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 entertainment, of, of entertainment, of the entertainment experience. Well, why would we want to do that? Well, if I'm a movie studio and I have to deal with flighty actors who um, are hard to work with and, you know, a top shelf actor like uh, Mel Gibson can cost, you know, millions of dollars or uh, Tom Cruise or Will Smith. These are million dollar actors. They command a high salary. They're pretty, you know, they're a risk because let's say Tom Cruise gets COVID-19 and he can't shoot anymore. Well, there goes my movie. Gee, why don't we just create, uh, why don't we just create either real life animation, uh, things that we can't distinguish from being done by robots or apparently cartoonish animation and start selling that. Well, what do we get? Well, it's complete IP, intellectual property. We no longer have to pay the actor. The actor doesn't get paid on the front and the back end. They have no claims on copyright. We own it all, all the time. And no matter what, we make it. And if we start, I, there was a slide I saw yesterday. It's a video of showing just a morphing of human faces. And they say, which one is done by a machine? And these are all look, look human. I mean, there's like hundreds of faces going by and they're all made by a computer. They're all made by a computer. So now we have entertainment. So let's see this thing we get over the TV. We don't, there is no human in our TV. There's no little man running around. We just see images. And the question becomes, are those images we're seeing on screen human or are they actually fully computer generated generated? It's a question I ask myself all the time. Sometimes I have to do the research. I'm just not sure. All right. So there we go. So now we have entertainment. Well, they're saying, well, there's things that humans really can do. Like, gee, humans always going to have to do these really personal, um, services that a human required for example a tailor a tailor needs to measure your clothes a tailor needs to send the measurements off to a cutter and a custom suit requires a lot of human labor well not anymore okay so this is a little robot uh it's called uh what it does is you send the robot the robot goes to the customer uh anywhere all um or anywhere on the planet these robots can just way you uh, uber truck or your Uber car can show up at your door. Why not send a cutting robot into your apartment, measure you up for a suit, send the data over to a tailor, a robotic tailor, or a human tailor in some other part of the world, cut your suit, uh, have put it in a box, and have Amazon deliver it to you. So there you go. That's what we call fine human. That's, that's an interesting one. So there you go on that. So I'm not trying to depress you, although sometimes I get a little depressed. Not much. I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful. But this is just interesting. So let's talk about uh, machine autonomy. Really, what, is it, what does a machine have to do in order to sort of be really, really human? Well, I'm saying this, these are um, what we call taxonomy, taxonomy skills. And the, the one on the left is actually a formal taxonomy by Benjamin Bloom. He's an educational psychologist called Bloom's Taxonomy. And this is the cognitive domain. And at the bottom, you have you know, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, calculating, evaluating, and creating. On the left, so that means oh, I can look. I can look at a pencil and remember it's a pencil, or better yet, I can look at a fork and remember it's a fork. How do I know it's a fork? Well, I'll hold a fork and a spoon up, and I'll go to my little two-year-old grandkid and say, "Which one's the fork?" And he's been told it's a fork long enough. He can remember it's a fork and point to the fork. And then we have understanding the difference between a fork and a spoon. So you hold up a fork and a spoon, and you say, "Which one's the fork?" And he can remember the fork. But he knows and he can remember that a spoon and he knows that a fork's not a spoon and he can understand the difference. And then we go to applying. What can a fork do? Well, we can take, you know, a fork is good for eating it. And then what's the forkness of things? So a forkness is that it can pick up stuff that's hard to pick up uh, because of its tines and we can stab it and use its fork to stuff. And then we look at a fork, we evaluate it. And we say, gee, you know, are there many different types of forks out there? What are the better forks? Well, for a fork with with four tines is probably better than a fork with one tine because for one time it's nothing but a spear. So we really want to put at least three, two to three, at least four tines in our forks. And a tine, if you can see me on the screen, is like my fingers, each of those would be four tines. And then we can look around and say, gee, well, I've given everything we know about forks. Gee, wouldn't it be really interesting if we create a new sort of thing that's based on a forkedness and we create a forklift? 
So really a forklift is two tines that go underneath a pallet, pick it up and move over a warehouse. And that's a cognitive domain. It's been well proven. A lot of educational psychology is geared around this, this concept of taxonomy. So then we move to physical. Okay, so, uh, oh, hello. Um, so uh, physical is that, you know, transmit, well, we uh, transmit is I can let you know about something. So if you have a, a newborn, a newborn, somebody, um, somebody is um, not muted, so please mute yourself. All right, so if we talk about transmitting, a newborn is born, and they can let you know when they're hungry, they cry. We call that transmission. Really, they don't, ex they don't communicate a lot. They don't, they can't take in information, but they can definitely send it out. And then the second, the second uh, motor skill, uh, motor skill is grasping. Uh, a child, one of the first things you want to see a child can do in its development is you put a, a, a stuffy toy in front of it and it will reach out to grasp it. And if you look at uh, early computer uh, UI devices, moving from the keyboard, which is fundamentally a transmission device, to a mouse is grasping. And then you want to be able to move about in 2D space. Which uh, So, uh, uh, you know, we talk about a vacuum cleaner, a vacuum cleaner, those, you know, those floor vacuum cleaners, they don't have to move in 3D space. You put it on the floor, it's a 2D plane, it moves around it. If it hits something, it knows to move out of the way. And then you go into 3D space, which is you know, where drones operate because they have to navigate you know, 3D space. Uh, and then, um, and, and, and then the converse means I have to be able to, I have to be able to negotiate interruption. I have to be able to negotiate interruption. And then we have to be able to manipulate objects in 3D space, and that's fine. So that's, in other words, I have to be, I'm a robot. I have to move a box from one pallet to another pallet. That's fairly easy. Not fairly easy. It's a very difficult thing for a robot to do as compared to a human. But as far as a physical activity, it's pretty easy. Move one box off of one spot in the, in the warehouse, put it in another spot. And then we get fine motor skills. And fine motor skills can be something like, you know, sewing a suit, or it could be something um, uh, playing the guitar, anything that requires, you know, fine manual dexterity. And then another one is replicate. I can make another one of me. I can make another one of me. Humans, you know, that's where human procreation. I can make another one of me. So this is all stuff humans. This is all humans have been doing this since they've been on the planet. You know, humans have been around for 10,000 years. They can do this. Animals can do this. Animals are very good. But machines haven't been able to do this, right? Because that's really bad. And when a machine can sort of get here, do we have to be concerned? Well, we never have to be concerned. Why should we? A machine can't do this. Right? None of the above. Well, no. Sad to say the machine can do it. And that's Boston Dynamics, very well-known robotic company. Um, there you go. Okay, so gee, but it's still, it's not thinking, is it? It's just sort of doing stuff. Well, do we really know? You know I think it's, there's a computer law that says if it acts human, it is human. Anyway, so this is the road to autonomous machines. That's what it looks like. We want to be able to, on the hardware side, we want movement, dexterity, recognition, integration, and, and self-replication. On the software side, we want conditional decision-making. Uh, identification, the decision would be, oh, oh, I'm a Roomba and there's a chair, I'm going to move around it. Identification means at a very gross level is if I'm, if I'm a drone and I'm, if I'm, if I'm a drone and I have kill capabilities built into me, I want to make sure that I'm actually killing, uh, um, you know, I'm shooting what I'm supposed to shoot. Inferential decision making means that, um, given a whole lot of options, I can make a decision based on those options. Networking, means I can negotiate other things and work in tandem. And learning means, you know, it's learning. I can absorb new skills based on my old data or my current data. And that's what we have. That is the landscape. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. And we are very, very close, very close. I can go into detail, but we're at minute 28. I forget how much time I have, but I don't want to eat it up. Because now we have to move into a little piece of historical drama. And the historical drama is this. This is what the technology curve, oh, sorry. This is what, this is, this is a, a, the technology curve. All right, and what's interesting here is if we look around in techno technological innovation, it's pretty flat. 
And where it starts going off the chart is in here, and this is really around the 1840s. In the 1840s, the steam engine. Once we get the steam engine, we get the Industrial Revolution, and things go off the chart, off completely off the chart. It took mankind 10,069 years to learn how to, it took them 10,903 10, years to learn how to fly, and it only took 66 years after that to learn how to get to the moon. That's an amazing, amazing growth in uh, technology. My grandmother saw, my grandmother, she was born in 1900. She saw the first plane. She boarded, she took her, boarded, saw the first plane in 1903. Uh, she took her first commercial flight, I think in the 20s. And she saw the first man go on the moon. Talk about a lifetime. Talk about a lifetime, all in her lifetime. And before that, it would never happen. So that's, that is the growth of technology. So anybody that says it'll never happen, I'm not buying, because historically it has. The trend is the trend is if it can happen, it will happen. The question is not when, if it's when, and when is a lot sooner than we think. So um, this is just a McKinsey blurb. Uh, uh, Three percent to forty percent of the workers around the world, <clears throat> and seventy-five million to three hundred seventy jobs, they're gone. Okay, uh, have to acquire new skills and switch occupations by twenty thirty, and that's op that's optimistic. That's optimistic. Um, but we'll talk about that in detail now. Um, I, I'll take a minute because I'm going to move into another part of the discussion. And I don't know if I can see. I can't see the chat. I really can't. I'm really not this familiar with running this in, in display mode. Or WebEx. I'm good with Zoom. I'm not that good with WebEx. But if somebody wants to put chat, uh, chat a is, question. Yeah, chat is. Uh, uh, I, I, have, I have shown the chat on the streams also. And let me ping you. So that well, if you just if you see a question there, feel free to ask it on somebody's behalf. If not, yeah. I'll keep moving. Yeah. So yeah, obviously, I would encourage people to uh, ask question uh, because this is very interesting and this is uh, very real, and 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 the whole platform of fifth IR fifth uh, fifth IR, as you know, is like we call it fifth IR. Luckily, we got that URL, uh, the domain five thir, and it means fifth industrial revolution. And this is this is this is this is not like a threat that Bob is talking about. This is reality, and we ha we all have to be prepared for that. And the whole purpose of this platform is that enable technologies, enable uh, our next gen kids also to uh, be ready for this this transformation, which is happening. Like it's like a tsunami is going to come, and it's going to come uh, very fast. Uh, we are not even able to persuade it. I was uh, we have been doing digital transformation. I I was a part of publicity sapient, and we have been uh, helping client to survive that 2030 era. And everywhere when we talk, when we connect with the people, the challenges that we are getting and the, the way we envision things in the autonomous car, autonomous industry, uh, you'll be surprised that, that the plans and the use cases are built uh, around it, whether either McKenzie does or Publicis Sapien does or, or many companies like that does. Uh, they are thinking around that. They are, they are selling their stuffs around that, but they even don't know what is going to happen in the next 30, 35 years. Is it going to stay or it's also going to move on? We have a flying car. Okay, have, yeah. Any questions? Okay, guys? thanks. Let me... Well, we okay, can... I'm going to move forward. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so let me go to here. Okay, oh, sorry. All right. So, okay, so there, there's, um, okay, there's five factors we're going to have to deal, contend with. Uh, we're talking increased per, per, per employee productivity, faster rates of innovation, just data, huge amounts of data that the world has never seen, wage polarization, what's called the wage tech winner take all market dynamic. So let's talk about, I'm gonna talk about each of these. Uh, this is increased productivity. Uh, um, this would, this, these numbers are from 2016. I haven't had a chance to go back in. I don't, I suspect they haven't varied a lot. I just don't get the sense that there's just, you know, nobody's gone bankrupt uh, in, in the last uh, four years here. But anyway, if we look at market valuation, Apple, Apple's, at, Apple's at the top. And a GM, which used to be the largest, um, used to be the largest corporation in America in, in the 30s and 40s, is now at the bottom. Um, so that that's just telling. And then if you look at all the market, the high market valuations, they're all software companies. Not all, but many of them are. And then if you look at number of employees, uh, then you have you got Walmart, Foxconn. Those are still many. Walmart is retailers, Foxconn, IBM has. IBM is surprised how many people IBM has. And at that time, Facebook. I think Facebook had 17,000. 
But if we look at net income per employee, uh, Facebook is usually productive, usually profitable. So is Apple, Google, and IBM, and Walmart. Um, IBM and Walmart, they're just down there. And Walmart, yeah, I think I had the slide coming up. No, I don't. But it's interesting. In order for Walmart to maintain profitability, they have to accelerate their uh, automation and remove their employee and, and reduce their employee headcount. A lot, a lot of their uh, expense goes to employee headcount. So they have to remove it in order to stay profitable. Anyway, so that just gives you an idea where it's going. The other thing that is missing from the slide is that uh, energy, the energy sector has always been, uh, uh, has a high net income per employee. Uh, uh, one oil rig, uh, an oil rig typically has 18 workers running six, six worker, three six worker shifts, uh, or they're living on the rig and they tend to be able to produce a lot. Uh, one atomic uh, nuclear reactor can produce a lot of electricity. So there's sort of something you want to keep an eye on about net income and per employee with regard to the energy sector. But outside of that, I mean, you know, the numbers do the talking, numbers do the talking, really, you know, boy, to be Facebook. Anyway, the, 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 this is an, an interesting one too. It's about the, the role of data. Uh, and if we go back, um, if we look, look at, uh, this is uh, from, I think, 20, 2008. Yeah, 20, if we look at 2008 up in 2014, we can see that just day, most, this is this for a telecom company. Then this is Ericsson. Uh, and uh, I think it's Terra. Anyway, but this, most people were talking on the phone. Most people were talking on the phone until if we look uh, until 2009. 2009 is the, uh, the, uh, the fourth quarter and then data goes up. It'd be interesting to see when Netflix started streaming. I suspect that's probably around that time. But now we're seeing just this is the movies. A lot of this is movies, but a lot more data. And just because it's movies doesn't mean it's not meaningful data. There's a lot of information in those streams, a lot of information in those streams that could be called. And then if we start looking at searches, you see searches just go up dramatically. And so the more data, the more data you have, the more machine machine learning is capable, the more machine learning opportunities are available and the smarter the machines can go. You need, a, you need a lot of data to make a machine smart. And we have it, we now have a lot of data. All right, so this is an, another interesting one. Um, this is uh, service industry versus manufacturing. And this goes to 2014. And as you can see here, back in 1939, uh, it's called white collar, white collar, blue collar or service industry back in 39 in the 40s, the fifth, even in the 50s, it was still here, uh, up here. This is the war, 1939, this is war. So um, so military manufacturing way up uh, here, and then it came back down again. And now here in 1959, you can see we had some service industries, travel agents, doctors, lawyers, and then we also had people making stuff. And then around 59, it just starts tanking. And you can see that service industries just start going up. And it's sort of interesting. It starts taking out tanking. It's I mean, it's been going off the roof. This is main in here. The 59 is mainframe. The first Univac came out and was sold commercially in 1952. I think I'll have to check my date, but it's around the 50s. And then up here, so now you see computer technology takes hold. And now here we have the PC, 1979, 84, the PC is mainstream. And you can see what happens. There you go. And then uh, which one is this? Uh, uh, oh, and this is data, uh, just how many data scientists there are now. This is interesting, 2015. Wow, is that pretty interesting? So data, really data, data is the old, you know, when we look at the emergence of, uh, of, of economic systems, you know, wealth was determined by land, you know, back before, you know, back in the feudal times. And then wealth is determined by uh, capital you know, with the rise of the Industrial Revolution. And there's a good argument to be made now that in our modern era where wealth is determined by data, how much data you have. The people with the more most data will actually have the most wealth because they can do the most analytics and makes their machines smarter over time. And um, the country that has uh, two countries, that the country that has the most data now is China, 1.3 billion people and their, 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 data, their data gathering capabilities are dramatic and we have India and the United States is still in there, but nowhere near where the other ones are. All right. So that's it. Okay. That's, um, this is, that's one. Let's talk about wage polarization. Uh, yeah, this is wage polarization. This is from the uh, Department of Labor. I have a question and feel if I don't hear an answer, I'm assuming you can't see my video screen. 
on the uh, main screen. And that's fine that she's being blocked out by one X because I can see it and it's okay. okay. Um, but uh, let's see here. This is, okay, so this is wage polarization. So if we go through here, this is the occupations with the most job growth between 2014, 2014, and I did this analysis here and i did a real simple uh, just a simple count and the most jobs and this is united states the united states the united states the median income is around 50 60 thousand a year if you're if you're making if you're making a hundred thousand a year u.s dollars you're in the top 10 percent if you're making uh, over four hundred thousand dollars a year you're in the top one percent but we can see here that most of the jobs that are occurring are going to be in the middle 20 20 k jobs Okay, and these are service jobs in some manufacturing, but they're not really well-paying jobs. We're up here. This is where the growth is. So what we're seeing is most of the job growth is going to be in lower, lower, lower income employment, which is sort of interesting in that. And then that, 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 these are just these are just the numbers. That's what we say. You got your receptionists, your heavy drivers. So there's not a lot. It's not like gee, over the next ten years, there's going to be all these great jobs making millions of dollars a year for everybody in the United States. The other thing I need to mention when I talk about here. Um, and I'll, I can grab the book. There, there, there's a book. I think it's by Pinker. Don't, don't hold me to it. But what we can see in the United States is a very privileged country. What we consider poverty in the United States is probably grand wealth in some countries. Just about every home in the United States has an, inter, has an indoor toilet, system, which is not true of most of the world. And we're aware of that. I'm aware of that. So I'm, I really am talking when we're here, when we're talking in the United States, not, not a very well paying job. In the scheme of the globe, these, are, these people are living like kings. But it's still not, it's still low wage work. And low wage work is not only wage compression, but it's easier to automate. Okay, let's take a look here. Okay, and this is now they're saying also that one of the, one of the uh, con pieces of conventional wisdom is that in order to get a well paying, good paying, well paying job, you need to have educate, you need to have a lot of education. And that's okay. But what I did here is I did a trend of uh, the project, I did an analysis of all the people. Of college educated people versus everybody else. Okay. And, uh, and what we're seeing here is that still only for in the United States, only 40% of the people are college educated, 60% uh, of people do not have college education. And then if we extrapolate out, it's going to become, it's going to, it's not going to go up. It's going to go down. Okay. So we see that in the 35% now, 40%. And, that, and that's in by 2050, 2035. So we're seeing, for a variety of reasons, which I can go into later if you want, if you're interested, I have opinions on, is we're seeing um, we're seeing we're seeing higher education in the United States become beyond the means of many. All right, now let's talk about winner take all. Winner take all is the notion that in order to become even viable, you have to own everything, and this became this was sort of Microsoft's mantra. Microsoft became very very at one time something like eighty percent. Of all the operating systems in the world, computers in the world were running like Windows, uh, and uh, and they, that was really winner take all. I had to own everything in order to be sustainable, and Microsoft was very uh, aware of that. Thus, you had the antitrust cases in the 1990s to break Microsoft up, and you're having now in the United States, you're having the antitrust cases being raised against Google and Facebook and Twitter because they really do. There is no competitor to Twitter. Sad to say. There is no competitor to Facebook. There is no real. There are competitors in the you know the web services space. Yeah, you got your Google Cloud, you got your Amazon Web Services, and you have your Azure and you know your Red Hat. But in terms of commercial IT for the general consumer, yeah, you got your DuckDuckGo for search. But most people use Google. And so what we're seeing is because it's winner take all, the the, the people that can play in that area tend to become very, very well compensated because the stakes are so high. So well, what do I mean by that? If we, this is Major League Baseball, and in 1970, um, <clears throat> if we look at the average in the, uh, to be uh, the minimum wage for a uh, baseball professional baseball player was $12,000 a year, and the highest paid player was making $29,000. Right? But now if we look at to go to 2010, the minimum wage for the major league baseball player is four hundred thousand, and the highest are paid over three million ten x. Right, so here it was three x, now it's ten x, and um, that's just interesting. If we look at CEO pay back in uh, nineteen seventy, uh, the CEO CEO made twenty times that of say a factory worker. So if I'm making five dollars an hour, if I'm making five dollars an hour on the floor, 
which back in 1960, I mean, my first job I had in 1973, I made 2.25 an hour in an after school job. And um, so anyway, if I'm McDonald's making 2.25, then probably the CEO at that time is making $40 an hour. Okay, which is still good money. I mean, you know, it's not bad money. But now if we look at 210, we're seeing that, you know, it's gone from making 20 times to 10 times that. So around here, you're seeing the CEO is making 200, 200 times the average worker. And now it's almost, you know, three, you know, 300 times the average worker. Phenomenal amounts of money. So that's one place. So we have compensation. And now we also have sales. Let's go over here to music. I find this one interesting that if I'm, an, if I was in a band, um, if I'm, if, I, if I'm in a band, and I wanted to go make some money. There's two ways I can make money as a band. I could go and um, sell, make records and sell records and make money from my records. Or I could go and tour. I could go and tour. And even though the record companies made a great deal from, uh, 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 from my, from my album, I still pay a royalty. And in some cases that those royalties could be if I had a million dollars selling album, selling a million units and I'm selling a million units here, I could still walk away a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. Right. But now because of streaming, what's happened because, you know, copyright laws are now sort of getting really wishy washy. Who owns what and when do they do it? We're seeing we're seeing that uh, musicians are being just taken to the cleaners, which is really there's no money to be made in producing a uh, producing a song. And I think this is spa. Uh, here it is in order to. Uh, oh, yeah, here it is. In order to get uh, FM, I'd have to get uh, a 1000. I'd have to get a million plays on FM to make like a living. All right. If I sold CDs, if I was a band and I could sell my CDs and all that, uh, I think I'd have to sell. Uh, I'd have to sell uh, uh, five thousand CDs a month to make a living. But then we can see that here. I can. I could make. The point is, and I'm sorry, I don't. I just don't remember the, the nuance of the statistic. But the point is here: making a CD is I, I owned a lot. Okay, and I could I could do a lot, make make a living selling CDs. When it goes only to FM streaming broadcast, I begin to lose income. I can't make a lot of money. And then by the time I get to Spotify, I have to sell a I have to get a ridiculous number of spins just to make minimum wage. So we're seeing winner take all. So now what happens is capital, or we can call these services, which are, there's not a lot of them, right? You, there used to be there are a lot of record labels, you, but there are not a lot of streaming services. So in order to make money, you have to get millions and millions of, of spins, and that's winner take all. Either either it's either feast or famine. If you're a musician. And you're one of the top 10 musicians in the world. You're making big money. If you're just a guy on, or a woman on the street trying to get over, you're not going to make money. And the only thing you can have is tour. So that means you have to show up and make music in person, which is not bad as long as you can make music in person. But now with COVID-19, those days are over. Anyway, let's move on. Then it came in COVID-19. How prescient. So what we have now is we're seeing we have this world in which we're seeing bifurcation of income, we're seeing you know, huge um, displacement of workers. We're just seeing a lot of stuff going on. And people are saying, well, it will always get better. And then COVID-19 comes along and it accelerates everything. It just accelerates everything. Well, we thought that by 2035 or 2050, we would see just this, this huge transformation. Now we can start saying, gee, this stuff might happen even sooner. Because what did 2019 do? Well, the first thing COVID-19 did is it just sent everybody home. Employment rates went up, and going back to the musician stuff. So, if you're a musician, there's no more venues. If you're a waiter, there's no there's no more restaurants. If you're working in a gym, there's no more gym. The gym down the street from me has been closed. I'm in California, granted, we're very strict, but the gym down the street from me has been closed since March. They're effectively, and if I'm a little gym that I pay my rent month to month, and I have maybe 500 members, I'm out of business. If I'm a big corporate conglomerate that can just write the check, I can live for a while. But what we're seeing is you know, just massive unemployment, even though it's sort of hidden, and we're seeing some people coming back to work. But the other thing is we've seen there's been a bifurcation. If you're if you're working in IT, you, um, I'll speak from personal experience. If I'm working in IT, and I am, uh, my, 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 my systems have been all over the planet. I've interacted with them remotely. I don't need to be anywhere. And right now I'm perfect proof. I don't need to be in your living room to deliver this. So you don't need to come to a venue to hear this talk. I'll just get online and doing it. If I'm to be a remote, uh, an efficient, effective remote worker, I'm just doing fine. My son-in-law, he's a manager, he's a manager in IT. He, he remotes. Everybody I know that is in IT is still working. The waitress across the street from me is out of work. 
Uh, my friend who's owned a restaurant, he's going bankrupt. Uh, the movie theaters, I can't even think about that. I, I just don't have the numbers. But the reality is, is that many of us will be working from home. And because many of us are going to be working from home, that means just a reduced workforce. What that means is cons- there's a great book by uh, Martin Ford called Rise of the Robots. Uh, it, that The notion of consumer technology it going away, as Bill Gates says, you know what? If you're depending on me to keep the hamburger industry going, you're screwed because there's only so many hamburgers I can eat. We need mass consumption in order to stay in business. But when people can't go out and consume and they can only buy online, it becomes very limited. So again, as I'm saying, it just COVID-19 has accelerated the trend. And if we look at the people who are out of work, right, there it is. All right. And these are low income wages. High income wages are not particularly affected. Low income wages are. It's except, I think, in the entertainment industry. But what we're seeing now is it doesn't matter because these people make movies, very little drama. That, that's not going to be affected too much. Okay, and this is on point. Minnesota, Minnesota is right in the middle of the country. It'd be interesting to see what it's in more manufacturing centered states like Alabama, Detroit. Okay, so then there's the rebuttal. But there's always been machines and replacing human, replacing human labor, labor. People have just gone on to do other things, right? That's the big one. People have just gone on to do other things. Don't worry, Bob. The machine, there's always going to be a job. You know, let's face it, the steam, the, the steam engine, you know, replaced, uh, re- replaced people working, baking their backs, digging ditches. And those people digging ditches went on to work in factories, ABC, DFG. That's great, except there's one problem that's called the singularity. This is a, a, a term devised by um, Ray Kurzweil. And the singularity is the point in which humans can no longer, can no longer consume the amount of information that needs to be consumed in order to work effectively, and that they either humans have to change, the nature of being a human has to change, or that the machines take over. And what we are going, what Kurzweil calls it, he calls it the transhuman, the, tra- the, tra- the transhuman era. And by transhuman, and we're seeing it now, that you know I can take a camera, I can put in a, cam- a, a small camera, shake my eyeball out, put a camera in, and I can record, if I want to just have, lose my sight in one eye, I can record my whole life. A friend of mine had, was deaf. And they put a cochal device behind his ear, and the cochal device bypasses his ear, and it goes right into his brain, and now he can hear. So that's transhuman enhancement. So that's at the mechanical level. Then we get to the biological level, where Kurzweil says, you know, this notion of education, of having to sit in a classroom, is sort of pretty outdated. It takes a lot of time. So how about this? Why don't we create a pill that will teach you French? So in order to having to sit in a classroom and take lessons and go to France and spend four years learning French, why don't we just create a piece of biochemistry that can alter your brain chemistry so that you immediately know French and you just take it. Is that possible now? No. Can it happen? Well, go back to the, um, go back to that chart I showed you about, you know, the growth of technology. If you can think it, and if there's a biological trace, it can probably happen. It will happen. So now we're faced with two things. Either human beings going to have to change or we're just, we just can't do it anymore. We can't do it anymore and we need machines to do it for us. Okay. So the uh, question is, what do we do when everything is automated? Okay. What do we do when everything is automated? Okay. And here's my, here's where I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some stuff, but the missing link where most people are not talking about at the governmental policy or even business level is they're starting from the, conventional wisdom that there will always be jobs. There will always be jobs. And I, my opinion and my educated opinion is that no, there will not always be jobs. And the place to start is instead of saying there will always be jobs is to start with the proposition that there are going to be a lot of people out of work. And it's not going to happen slowly. It's almost like, gee, COVID didn't happen slowly. One day, a virus got out and it started. And it didn't, it took under a year for that to happen. And so the question, but there will always be jobs. So let's go back to the in commerce. And this I'm revealing a little bit of my policy thinking. In commerce, the value of human labor is to do stuff. The value of human labor is to do stuff. If a human can do it better than a machine, I'm going to hire a human. All right. Well, let's face it. It does. Why do why do we hire humans? You know, if I why why because I can't get the machine yet. Right. And I can go into a lot of stories about 
where that plays out. But the biggest one is horses. In the, in the city of New York, in the city of New York in 1890, there were 200,000 horses in the city of Manhattan. And they, they moved, tra- they moved tra- trolleys. They moved, um, uh, they moved people. They uh, moved carts. They moved commerce. Everything that a truck was doing or a car was doing, they did that. They also powered some low-powered machines where you put a horse or a stupid horse, an old horse, and they just walk around in circles for the rest of their life, right? So 200, and there were, I mean, horses were dying in the streets. There was a whole, the Department of Sanitation in New York didn't start as the people that picked up your garbage. They, their job was to remove horse manure from the street. And you know, that's why you had the people with the brooms and the uh, uh, barrels and the white coaches removing horse manure. 200,000 horses. Today in the city of New York, there are under a thousand horses, right? The horses are gone. Horse labor is no longer needed. And it, this may sound cruel, and I don't mean it to be because I'm really I'm sincerely, deeply concerned, but we didn't need the horses. And guess what? There are no more horses. Now, we didn't take all the horses out and shoot them. They just didn't need them. They didn't breed, you know, didn't need them. Could that happen in the units? Well, um, I think so. All right. So if we look at, um, if we look at still, we're still seeing the trend go in or you get the you know, top 10%. still pretty much they're beginning to own capital is, uh, capital is, if it's between capital and labor, capital is going to win every time. History has proven that. And we, uh, if you want to argue it, feel fine, but feel free, but, uh, you'd have to do a lot to convince me otherwise. And so, um, what do we do? What do we do if indeed there's no more money to be made? Human labor is no longer needed. There's a good argument to be made, and I support that, that one of the easiest ways to fight poverty or to help people that are not earning enough money or do not earn enough money is just to give it to them. Just give it to them. Don't do any programs. Don't do any complex stuff. Just give them the money. And that money turns out to be universal basic income. Universal basic income. And um, the, the trick with universal basic income is people say, well, if you give people stuff, they're just going to sit home and do nothing. Well, guess what? COVID-19 is sort of giving us a scenario of what that might look like, what that might look like. Yes, they might sit home and do nothing, but they don't. That's so what? Because the economy doesn't really need them unless you're doing some other stuff. So the problem with universal basic income, other than we'll call it the moral, the, the moral factor, if you give people, uh, if you give people money, they'll become non-productive and they'll just be a drain in ECDFG, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's an argument. It's not one I support. The more critical factor in universal basic income is that it's not enough. So if we accept the premise that one of the easiest ways to fight poverty and particularly in the age of automation is to give people money, the trick is you got to give them enough money. Now, in UBI in the United States has been around for a while. People don't call it UBI, but up in Alaska, the state of Alaska has what's called the Alaska Permanent Fund. And because there's so much oil up in Alaska, there's so much oil revenue uh, back, way back, I don't know when, I think it may be in the 60s, the state of Alaska created what's called the Permanent Fund, which distributed $1,884 a year to every person living in Alaska. If you live in Alaska, you're given money. You're given money. However, when you break it down, it's, you know, 157 bucks a month, which isn't really enough to get over. Just not enough to do a sustainable, to live a sustainable life. However, in Cyprus, Cyprus has a universal basic income program. And I have to go back and read the law because a friend of mine said it needs to be rewritten or I misread it, that everybody in Cyprus is given a certain amount a month. But you have to be willing, if work is available, to take the work. So it's not really UBI, it's sort of UBI light. But in Cyprus, everybody's given $546 a month. And that's okay because an apartment in Cyprus costs 500 bucks a month. So if you're a two-family, if you're a two-family um, household, that means you're getting, you know, 11, you know roughly $1,100 a month, which you can live on. You can live on. That becomes a justifiable, you know, uh, justifiable income to live, you know, just bare, bare minimum. And that's, that, that's something to consider when we talk about UBI. The question isn't whether we need UBI. The question is ensuring that UBI is actually effective. That means that it needs to be enough. Already being tried, hopefully, around the world, everywhere, okay? 
they're trying it. Some people are stopping it. Some people are starting it. You know, it stops and starts, stops and starts. But this is nothing new. This is nothing new. And, it, and again, as more people are home and people that are used to making money, that are used to having middle middle uh, class incomes or, you know, middle, um, in, middle I'll call them middle kingdom incomes, middle incomes, people that are used to making money and no longer making money, that could just be a traumatic effect. And we're seeing in the United States, particularly now when the um, – uh, the unemployment benefits from COVID start running out at the end of the year. What's that going to look like? Now, that's one thing. Okay, so now we've given people money. We've taken away the problem of, gee, okay, we have robots doing everything, and um, we've taken care of, you know, people aren't going into starvation mode and, you know, living in the streets. We don't have revolution, people breaking in and destroying robots like the Luddites did in the 1890s or 1850s. So that we've taken care of that. We've taken care of the wage problem. That's only one problem. The other problem is the purpose problem. And it's going to take me about two minutes to explain this, but it, 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 it's useful. Useful. Um, it, if we think about human development, in, in human development, a, a, a newborn has no sense of time segmentation. So those of you that have children, you might recall that when my kids were little, they would just run, they would just um, go until they dropped. They just had no sense since I need to rest and everything. There was no such thing as an hour, a minute, a year, any of that. It just go and stop. And that's why we said, oh, by the way, you have nap time, now it's lunch time, and now you have time. We started giving them a way to organize their time internally. They couldn't do it though as a child. And so when you start going to school, what happens is that when you go, when you go to school, uh, your time is organized for you. So if you remember for the United States in kindergarten, everything was segmented in pretty much 30 minute lessons. You had 30 minute activities so the child could get used to segmenting time. Then you had nap, lunch, you know, uh, activity, and then your parents would take you to go home. And then you go home and have dinner time and then bedtime and your parents read to you and you go to sleep and you start up the next day and do it all over again. The humans learn how to organize their time internally. It's not something you're born with. Then when you get to high school and in the United States in high school, what happens is you, that you go to the class in elementary school, the class comes to you. So you would sit in one class and as a primary school, you sit in one classroom all day and the teachers with different teachers would come in. In high school, what happens is that you move from class to class. That's why the schools are architecturally different. They have wider halls, people moving through class and moving through class. Then when you get to college, what happens is you you don't meet your classes don't meet every day. Your classes might meet some classes met every day, but mostly in my experience, you had a class that met once or twice a week for a couple hours, and you were left to your own to do all the outside work. Because by the time you're in college, you're expected to be able to organize your time on your own, and you can do what you need to do. Your internal systems have been regulated. Okay, and then when you go to uh, getting into the workforce, you know, you get up, you drive to work up until recently, you, you do your job, you have lunch time, you know, you go, you know, you break time. If you're working on a flat factory floor, it's even more regimented. You get up, you do your job at 10. I, I worked on factory floors, so I can report this. You do your, you get your 10 o'clock break, you have your lunch break, you have your three o'clock break, and you go home, you have dinner, you watch TV, and you go to bed. You're still, your time is very segmented. And if you're a professional, you, you pretty, you lift a little more to yourself, but this, but your, your regulators are in there. You're in, as an adult, your regulators are based on the workplace, right? I have a job. I go to it every day. That job is really well organized and I can adhere to that organization. Now, what happens when that goes away? Okay. What happens when that goes away? is that some people can adjust, but many people cannot, and things happen. You see increased depression, you see alcoholism, you see obesity, you see just a boatload of problems because people in turn don't have the time to organize them. They don't have the method or the means to organize themselves. They have no purpose, all right? Purpose goes away. This need, the need to self-regulate self goes away. So if some people just watch TV. I mean, I look at, you know, when my father retired, he did not have that ability to organize his time. So the TV set did it for him. The shows began and started at a certain time. And that became the regular regulation mechanism. When work goes away, we're going to see a lot of people just voided out, voided out completely. And that's a real danger. 
And if we start looking, what becomes interesting to me is if we start looking at the social situation now where we see more people uh, unemployed or maybe not unemployed as in there's not work, which is non-employed or sitting home without a way to regulate themselves, they start gravitating onto things that will re do their internal regulations for them. And a lot of that's being expressed politically right now. So what to do about it? Um, to wrap it up here, uh, I think UBI is totally necessary. Um, with regard to purpose, I think it's going to be essential that we start creating uh, methods of organizations, whether they be public service or internally community-based things that people can do in a way that's uh, segmented and organized so they at least have a sense of purpose and organization in their life. If not, we're only beginning to see the beginning of things that are going to go strange. Things that are going to go strange. So um, if you like, I'm at the end now. I've gone on a little over time. There is my book. Uh, it's called The Impact of Automation. It's about 30 essays. I discuss all of this in detail in the book. Uh, it's for free. Feel free. Go. There's the uh, URL. If you want to take a screenshot of it, or if you want, we'll make it it's available on the uh, event page. And uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Thanks for your time. I know it's late for you. It's early for me. I hope you found this talk useful. And I'll stand by now if there's any questions that you want me to answer as best I can. And I'm going to stop sharing. Yep. Uh, any question, guys? I think this is fantastic. Uh, any question from anyone? Uh, Hello. Yeah, I'm seeing a question. The mean income employee, mean income for employee. Um, uh, you're going to see. I forget what my mean, mean my forget mean, median, mode, and range. Uh, which one? I forget which one mean is. Can somebody who asked the question explain? Uh, just refresh my me refresh my memory. I just wanted to know whether it is the average income. Uh, you know, I was looking at the slide where you have shown Facebook, Apple, and the other companies. Uh, like, was it based on a particular <coughs> profile of the person, age group, or something? Uh, and uh, whether it was just a mean in average income of the guys. Can you write the question in the chat window? Because you're breaking up. I don't mean I just, it's easier for me because the communication is a little, a little strange. Well, going back to the slides, going back to the slides I show, uh, uh, mean, mean, mean is average, median is where uh where mean is average so th this is what i what i what we did is i think they go through and they take they take a number of employees and they take the number of incomes and they divide it to get the average right uh so look, that is average that, that i think that calculation is based on average the median would be to my recollection i just forget the terms is that the median would be uh if we have a hundred people uh, where uh, exactly where um, half where where the actual number distribution would be in half. So um, the, the big one would say. Uh, so so to, to answer yeah I, the answer to your question I think I think it's average it's mean. I, I know it's not the best answer but it's the only one I have right now. Any other questions? Any other thing? Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, uh, my name is Arvind Kumar. Okay. And uh, my question is like, uh, there are two uh, two thoughts which are popular these days. Uh, one side, the people are saying uh, the automation will take away everything. The another thought is uh, there are some uh, people who think positively, like uh, earlier we had computer and we have a lot of thing, technology, if you will go into the history. And every time uh, it was told that uh, it will take everything out. But uh, even in uh, developed countries, there is a lot of who and cry out computers. But ultimately, uh, it makes people's life better. There is, there is two uh, way of uh, uh, thinking in this direction. What about the other side? What about the positive side? Well, th well, there's a, there, you bring up a good point. There's a question of quality of life. And there's a difference in quality of life and employment. All right. And this is not about whether technology is good or bad. Technology in a par is good. I mean, let's say I think one of the more 
there's a, there's a one in the in my, I have a chapter in the book where I talk about speech recognition at Google AI and what what Google has done is actually they pushed all a lot of machine learning into their into Android Android now is just a lot of machine learning built in internally you don't have to go back to the cloud and one of the things they do is they ha they act they have speech to uh, text to speech recognition and there there's this wonderful video I saw where this woman in India who's illiterate she literally can, she can't read or write. And she would have to depend on a lot of other people to help her get through her, you know, activities of daily living. But right now, what she does takes the phone, goes to the bank, puts the phone in front of the monitor, and then monitor the phone talks to her and tells her what's to do. So in that sense, technology has very been very liberating. Or the quality of her life has improved dramatically. There's no question about that. All right, at an individual basis. Let's face it. You know, uh, uh, let me. I'll give you another real life funny. My granddaughter. My granddaughter has cystic fibrosis. All right, my granddaughter said, and when I was a when I was a child, if you had cystic fibrosis, you were dead at five. Dead at five years old, you were dead. There was no no question about it. That was it. Your lifespan was five years old. Now her life, her expected lifespan is in the forties. That's a dramatic improvement. All right, to my much to my appreciation. I mean, that's great, but that's quality of life. Now the question becomes: There's two things. If indeed technology displaces people, labor, we're talking in terms of pure labor, if indeed yeah. human labor becomes valueless, right? And there's, okay. there's a good argument to be made that not all human labor will become valueless. Okay. But let's say that all, remember, go back to that chart I showed you that said only 60% of the people in the United States, only 40% have college educations. Right. And it, it used to be you could learn how to do a job in five minutes. If, if it, it used to be you could learn how to do a job in five minutes, 10 minutes, and you could be productive and earn a wage after five to 10 minutes of training. How long does it take now to become an, a minimal, effective computer programmer? Minimal. Min now, the, the code academies are saying, oh, I can get you a job in six months. And I've, I've seen those people. They're OK. They're not great. To become good takes about five years. Right. So the point no, is, uh, I, I actually, this point I'm not agree. Like uh, you want to, you can uh, do the programming in six months, but when you build uh, some uh, great systems, it will take years of practice in a particular uh, domain. Right. And right. I we're, we're we're in agreement here. So what I'm talking about is, okay. is what do we do about human labor? Right. So if it takes five, first of all, if it takes five years to learn how to do something, that means you already had in the United States. You, it means you already have the money to take, let's say, even to take a, take a part-time job and five years of study, right? That means you have those, those financial resources. In the United States, I have to dig out the exact number, but it's something, and don't hold me to this until I produce it for you, but it's something like half the people in the United States, if they were asked to come up with $400 for an emergency situation, could not do it. Okay, okay. Uh, just... Um just a little bit more. My question is uh, whether all work will be over because ultimately uh, we are going on Mars and there are a lot of new opportunities are coming. And uh, I think the uh, low skilled people will get uh, some technology know how of that. Uh, ultimately, the as soon as the technology will come, more job will be created. And uh, can we automate everything? Well, what's that? that it's not a question of can we, of course we can, it's a question of when. Okay. And that's, that's the miss. If you start talking to people that have political power or they, that's not part of their discussion. They don't get. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. They're, they're not saying, oh, by the way, this is a real problem and we better start thinking about it. Right. It's like, oh, yeah. we have this thing called COVID-19 and we better start, you know, it's like, there sat, you know, fortunately, that actually pandemic has been part of the national uh, part of the general discussion for many years. There's, the, people understood that epidemiologists, they understood the dangers. But when we start saying, oh, gee, what do we do when half the work, half of the population, right, is, is valueless in terms of labor? It goes back to, you know, let, you know let's say, you know, and I, I don't mean this the wrong way, but you could, you know, you could always pull a, you know, in some, in, let's say in an underdeveloped country, the worst case is you could always pull a rickshaw, right? Okay. Yeah. But help me understand what, why rickshaws, why would we want to do that? 
why would I why would I want to pay a rickshaw driver a dollar when I can pay an automated device ten cents? Definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank thanks. you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Uh, Sujit here. Uh, uh, I just wanted to ask one question, which which goes with one of the slide that you had. That is winners. So. Oh yeah, uh, winner take all. I, sure. Go ahead. So there is this one situation where if I think uh, 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 working with uh, uh, like Facebook or uh, Microsoft or any com data field, uh, working with that company as an employer, employee, or being a CEO of uh, some sm small scale startup, uh, what would be the preferred if I, I, I work in data, uh, uh, what we can say, uh, area, it could be data, uh, analytics area so which would be the best way to go ahead do i go with a job in microsoft as a data analyst or oh 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 yeah i mean you want uh, let me answer sincerely okay i'm gonna and this is this is, i'm gonna be a little controversial here but it's worked for me it's worked for me i've i i'm very clear about the difference between having a job and making money and as jobs go away, the thing to focus on is making money, if indeed, because really money is not going to go away, right? Money money's just not going to go away. Jobs will go away, but not money. So what becomes interesting then is the ability to um, analyze a landscape and see where money making opportunities are. That's the first, the first thing is, first thing is being able to see where money making opportunities are. And then for myself, the decision I made, I made this decision about really 10 years ago, was the goal, instead of the goal, my goal in terms of money is I want to live as well as I can on as little money as possible. Now, I, I do okay. I mean, I'm not a wanting person. My refrigerator is full and I, have, I don't want for anything. But my goal has always been to keep my expenses down. And to keep my cat to have my capital, my capital exceed my expenses. And so they do so that you means you can take advantage of money making opportunities. So it's to, to address your saying, instead of saying, what company do I go to in terms of data analytics? Right. Or if I want to do a startup, I look around and I say, OK, what what first of all, what can I do that that's going to have legs and by legs? I mean, you know, long term, long term viability. And where where do where do I see that? Uh, where do I, what 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 opportunities do I see in that area? All right, and that that becomes tricky as time goes on and automation becomes more prevalent. It it, it becomes much more tricky. There's always going to be what's interesting. I'll tell you some more. I'll, say, I'll tell you some opportunities I do see emerging right now. Um, one 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 of the things that's happening is that. Uh, in computer science, English has always been the de facto language, much to my benefit. I mean, all English speakers enjoy a uh, an incredible just you know, what's what I'm looking for. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to shy away from the word privilege because it's not a privilege. You just have an advantage if you speak English. You have an advantage in computer science because all the documentation and the languages themselves are sort of English-like. However, what we're seeing now, and it became telling to me, I went to a very, uh, I went to a, a technology site and, and it actually published in two languages, English and Chinese. So I'm seeing the emergence of Chinese technology, of Chinese uh, technology and Chinese, particularly around Chinese language as being something worth paying attention to. It's something worth paying attention to. The other thing uh, that's coming up is that still no matter what it's what you what what are people what are people willing to pay money for and how can i supply a service or a product that is money making in that regard and it doesn't have to be people it could be other companies and that requires a little more uh interest inspection and introspection than in just going to a, a job site and looking at job qualifications typically what's worked for the me and, and those like me is that instead of applying for a job, we say, here's our, here's what we're doing right now. 
and there's our portfolio and this is what we're interested and take a look at this and does this interest you too and uh, companies tend to companies tend to like that right now and that's a separate other issue but eventually we're all going to get at the point where what do what do i need right and then and it's going to my, my, my thinking is it's going to be real high level ai real high level data analytics that are just like off the charts on, on the scope of macroeconomics it requires a lot of education a lot of experience to do but that's me you know i'm speaking more improvisationally now than in a fact-based mode oh i hope that was useful yes yes thank you i wish i could say yeah just you know go out and learn r and learn python and by the way be able to do you know uh, binomial equations and everything will be fine but it's not no sorry it's going to require a lot more creativity a lot more I think my, my only, the only thought was that uh, whether if i want to invest my 20 next 20 years uh, in analytics should i think about going for a micro or should i start my own company and then uh, define my uh, what do you what, what do you like to do? Well, it's not, it's what, what, what are you good? What, what, if indeed, let's go back and say, you know, if money, my, my, this is what I just only tell people, if money was off the table, what would you do? In other words, if you didn't need to make money, what would you do? Go for my own startup. Right. But that's, that's pretty amorphous because you don't need the money anymore. What would you do? That's a pretend, right? Can you can you uh, give an you example? I, 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 yeah, yeah. All right. So if I didn't have to make money anymore, probably what I would do is I would continue doing my research. I'm very interested in the American Midwest and how uh, the how uh, uh, technology companies emerged out of the American Midwest. I think there's something going on in there, and also particularly how industrial countries emerged how industries emerge out of Detroit. Why did all the auto manufacturers end up in Detroit? That interests me, right? Now, because of that, I, there's, and if we go back and look at Bloom's taxonomy I talked about earlier, there's higher orders of cogn cognition. The real human intelligence and human activity is still needed at the higher order of Bloom. And I'm gonna put it in the chat window. Do look up Bloom's taxonomy. I, I recommend that. Um, because that's really evaluation that's an analysis evaluation and synthesis in other words being able to put a motorcycle and skis together and come up with a snowmobile right and those skills those skills are, are still profitable those skills are in demand to be able to be able to, to design a better ski that work is done already there's no way there's no sense in doing it but being able to take disparate technologies or disparate ideas and synthesize them into new thinking that's useful so for me and so money off the table so by the way i would go back to doing that because right now but i can still my research skills are still such that i can actually figure out how to draw to connect the dots between things that don't seem very connectable but are so for example i'm I, you, what i'm working on a series now about the evolution of the modern modern data center and if you go back and look when mainframe computers came along um there was a problem with mainframe computers in that they couldn't uh because of the um because of the network there was no network protocols it was just basically serial ports serial ports couldn't be any a wire couldn't any be longer than 18 meters and because they couldn't be ever longer than 18 meters everybody was clustered around this machine and they were doing pretty much data entry, but still it was called the data processing center because it was in one floor. It was actually in a big room on a floor where all the operators were within 18 meters of the machine, given the physical constraints of the technology, and they became data processing centers. That was one aspect that led to the uh, growth of what we call the data, the data center. Also, a company like Capgemini started as a data processing center. Right? That's just me. I happen to be interested in that stuff. The point I'm trying to share with you is that you have to, the, the trick in be, staying viable is to work at the higher order of Bloom's taxonomy, being able to take disparate things and put them together into new ideas. 
and you have to find something that excites you because that's the only way you can pull it off. You don't have to, but it's useful for what it's worth. That and a dollar seventy-five will get you to the beach in Los Angeles. Bob, yes. yes. Oh, I'm wondering if I'm coming through. Can you hear me? Okay, Rick calling from the UK. Rick from UK. Yes, a new call. Hey. Yes. <laughs> yeah, go, go for it. Okay, so um, thank you for that uh, uh, slides and extra. Very, very interesting indeed. I'm also enjoying reading the impact of automation. Um, a lot of lot of good thoughts coming. Um, can I just ask you um, regarding all of the charts that you've put up there, etc., and the figures and tables and stuff? How do you gain all of your um, information? Are you oh. are you actually doing all the research yourself? Oh yeah. Oh well, no. I go out. I mean, I cite the stuff where it comes from, right? right, um, right. Um, I use um, there's, I use the I use the internet. I use it for United States the Department of I, I you know we were running into an, an, a, a time in human history where nobody believes anything anymore. They don't not believe but know anything. But yeah. I, I still think the department of I think I still think the the Commerce Department data prior to uh, 2018 is still pretty good. Um, so I, I use that. I use Statista. They're pretty. They're reliable. Uh, I use the. Uh, st I use actually. There's some of the financial stuff. Those are just fundamentals that come right. out of uh, that. Uh, the SEC requires public companies to reveal. So all those okay. data stuff. Uh, RPE number. I mean the RPE. You can get. You can figure out average RPE by going in to the company's reports. They they will report in their fundamentals. You know on Yahoo Finance. You get the number of employees. Employees, the gross, and the, you get the number of employees and the gross, and then you, you know do the division, and that'll give you a clue, that'll give you a somewhat gross idea. Okay. Uh, so you still want to go to margins? So there's stuff out there. It's there's also scholar.google.com. Um, I use Wikipedia. I send money. It's coming to the end of the year. Everybody send your money to Wikipedia because they do do a good job. Um, but not only do I read the articles, I go down into the references uh, and I try to get to the dissertations if I can. I don't know so if you're essentially using uh, published stats, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would, no, or, uh, no. I'm not at the point yet where I'm making it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, thanks. Uh, uh, as I say, it was really interesting, and some some very good looking guitars there in the background. Oh yes, I yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I, I actually, uh, I made I I was a I was a luthier for five years. I made guitars for five years. I had a guitar making business. Oh wow. Uh, I, but the reason I don't, I'll tell you why, the reason I don't do it, there's two, it goes back to actually this discussion, if you want to hear it. I'm happy to share. Okay, nobody's saying don't do it, so I will. Go for it, go for it. Okay, I'll go for it. All right, so in guitar making, guitar making up until uh, was basically two companies at the start. There used to be lots of guitar makers, right? And there are individual luthiers. And, you know, go back in history, one time before assemblies came along, people made guitars one-offs. Right, there were luthiers, Stradivarius, and all those people. And then with, man with manufacturing, you get your Gibson and your Vendor and your Martin guitars, and they figured out. And I've been the tailor; I've been down to the factories, and I'll talk about that, where they uh, you made guitars in mass production. And guitars, you know, when I, even when I was a kid, you, you know, guitars were not cheap. Even mass produced ones, to get a good guitar would cost you about you know five five hundred to a thousand dollars in money at that time. Now what happens is you can buy uh, you can buy a whole lot of guitar for ninety nine dollars. Um, you can, and the reason is there's a, a thing called computer. For those of you that are woodworkers, you probably know this, but it's called CNC, computer navigated carpentry. And what the way CNC works is that you you take your uh, designs in PDF format, and there's a and you buy what's called the CNC machine. And the CNC machine, machine, a small one, costs about nine hundred dollars. An industrial one costs about ten thousand dollars. And it's really it's a bed. It's an eight by four bed. And they become bigger, and you lay the wood. You secure the wood onto the bed. You put your design in, and then these robotic arms come along and they cut. They do all the cutting at a very fine grain, uh, and um, so that's one to do the bodies. And uh, when I went to the Martin factory, the, the Martin factory, uh, not Martin, excuse me, the Taylor factory, they cut necks using CNCs. The way they did finishing, guitar finishing the guitar, spraying on the lacquer 
and spraying and doing the buffing, it's a, it's a skill, it's a science because you have to do it just right and required a lot of human intervention. So what Taylor did is they went out to Detroit and they went to the car manufacturers and they looked at the uh, machines that do auto finishing, painting, painting and buffing. And what they did is they adapted those machines to do finishing and buffing. So if you go to Taylor, there's a room <clears throat> where they line up the guitars, they pull the bodies, not, not the necks, they don't do the assembly yet. They do the bodies, they pull the body, it goes into a room, it gets sprayed, and then it gets sent down. Then there's another room where a robotic arm will pull the guitar and it'll do, it'll hold it and then a buffing arm comes across it. And the first ones, it took a while because the buffing arms kept uh, crushing the bodies, but eventually they got it down. So all buffing now is done by machine. So where are humans working in Taylor? Well, humans are, there's a place, humans are still loading the wood into the drying kilns because in order to make a guitar, you have to work with very dry wood. That's one place. Humans are working what's called in the, um, doing the, uh, um, the binding and the, and the little, the artwork that goes around the circle of the guitars and the binding, there's a name, I forgot it. Uh, they're doing that. And they're also doing what's called setup. And setup is when the guitar is ready to be shipped before they do it um, on electric guitars, when you put the strings on and you have to tune, the, you have to intonate the neck of the guitar. So the reason it's relevant to me is I, I started making, I became a pretty good luthier. My guitars cost between four and 5,000 because that's what it took for me to make a make a buck but then when i started it became that i was spending a lot of time making it would take me maybe a month or two to make a guitar maybe three and i could make maybe i could make myself you know maybe two thousand dollars a month making guitars and so it became a point where i had to do one of two things either i had to open a factory invest in cnc machines right and to start doing these pre-cuts that i was doing by hand and i have videos out on youtube where I show you how to do this, or I needed to take a couple years off, spend pay a master to get me to the next level. And there's a guy named Jens Ritter out there. And I'll put it in the chat. Take a look at his stuff. Um, Jens Ritter, his guitar started twenty thousand dollars a pop. Okay, and oh dear, <laughs> and, 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 but he's really, really good, really good. I'm not that good yet. But I would have to say, okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take five years off. I'm going to beg Ritter to allow him to become one of his competitors and go work with him for slave wages, learn his technique, get really good. And then I'll come back in five years and I'll do this, right? Or I can open my CNC factory. So the good news is when I was doing my own Lutheran work, my expenses were 300 bucks a month rent plus my machines, which were capital. I already paid for those. Once I go into a factory, my rent goes up, my electricity goes up, my insurance goes up, all this stuff goes up. And guess what? I'm not making guitars anymore. I'm running a CNC machine. Yeah, you. I guess that's another very good example uh, of automation and where the amount that he, of human work that gets involved is diminishing. Right. Yeah, it does. And I can say, if you send me um, wrestlebob at gmail.com, I'll send you the pictures. I have them from Taylor, or you can look at Taylor. Yeah, that, it's done. So I can go into Guitar Center and also remember winner take all Guitar Center, which is now going bankrupt, interestingly enough, because now it's going to be driven. It's going to be driven the online. A friend of mine owned a music store out here, Time Warp Music, and he had something like a thousand guitars in there and his rent landlord raised the rent and he raised the rent. So he said, screw this. He closed the store, he took all the guitars and he's selling them online. All right. Well, okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. That's very interesting. Yeah, I know you wanted to know that. Okay, Rick and UK. See you later. Any other questions? Right. Any other questions before I go? Um, any question, guys? I have already sent the speaker code, which you can use to take the certificate for this event. And there is a link that you can use to download the Bob book. And adding to that, uh, Bob, just uh, adding a little bit about Rick. Rick is the co-founder of MultiCloud for you. And oh, good. Yes, yeah, so he is the CEO UK, and that he was talking from there. And uh, I am I am from India, and Dheeraj was another guy who initially uh, talked to you, and the Vaskar he interacted with you. Um, we are all the founders at MultiCloud for you. So, any other question, guys? Or I think we are already. Uh, um, much, yeah, much we'll more. Yeah, much more. We passed. We passed. Then yeah. Hi, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, I think Rick has already asked me. That was basically the guitar. 
was basically giving me the excitement as well. So he already did ask that question, which I was thinking of asking about it. But yeah, um, it was great. <laughs> Very great having you on, on on the on our platform. Okay, great. Well, thank you for inviting me. I had a good time. I hope I yep. didn't overstay my welcome, but it was great. And just you know, it's going to come. Be aware and you know, think about it. Yeah, and and the Thanks. recording is already available on the uh, on the page event page. It's all automatically get uploaded, so it will be there within a minute or two. Thank okay, great. Much. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.